Girls, here is to a new world. Marriages, men, parties. Not particularly in that order. <laughs> Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks of what the Buccaneers gets right and wrong when it comes to historical accuracy. We're talking about the series as a whole, so watch out for spoilers. Pure theater. Number 10. Victorian Holiday Celebrations Right. The Buccaneers follows its characters through the seasons, and for the most part, the seasonal celebrations are accurately depicted for the time and place. A Victorian Christmas may well have included charades, which was a popular parlor game of the era. If we knew him, I'm sure it would have been very good. I, I, did, I, did, I didn't know anybody. The Scottish New Year tradition of first footing was also practiced in England during this period. To bring luck, the first foot through the door should be a good-looking man, while blondes were believed to be less lucky. But what about Richard? Oh, he's wandering around like a lame duck. Or a girl. But we can't have him cross the threshold first in that state. God knows what rotten luck we'll invite. Guy Fox Knight, which commemorates the failed gunpowder plot of 1605, is also depicted in the show. Burning a guy and eating treacle toffee are both traditions associated with this UK holiday. However, during Victorian times, it was primarily a working-class celebration. Why would we celebrate blowing up Parliament? We didn't actually manage to blow it up. Mm, most English thing ever, he was bad at it, so let's celebrate. Number 9. Attitudes to Race – Wrong Thankfully, period dramas have become much more inclusive in recent years. The Buccaneers includes both gay and non-white characters amongst its leads. However, despite a diverse cast, the show barely scratches the surface on the subject of race. Conchita, don't raise your voice, please. My voice isn't raised. <laughs> What's the first? Of the characters of color in the Buccaneers, only Conchita's heritage is referenced. We never see her parents, and the discrimination she faces presents more like modern-day racism than its less subtle historical counterpart. Oh, that would be very easy, I'm sure. No, thank you. We're not accepting those accusations. Bridgerton wove the characters' ethnicities into the storylines to create an alternative version of history. Meanwhile, the Gilded Age and Sanditon took a more traditional approach. The Buccaneers does its own thing, but it could probably have delved a little deeper. We're oblivious. Lucky you. Number 8. The Costumes – Wrong Another way in which the Buccaneers puts a modern spin on this classic story is through the costumes. I didn't bring any party clothes. I virtually just bought night clothes. I'm sure Cita won't complain. <laughs> the costume designers took inspiration from the late Victorian era, but didn't stick too closely to the rules. Instead, they got creative. I must show you the dress that I'm wearing. <laughs> I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm going. It's gonna be worth it. The first step was to convince the writers to move the story forward 10 years to 1880, when the silhouettes and hairstyles were less fussy. The team kept the corsets and trademark bustles while experimenting with color and fabrics. They eschewed pastel tones for bright jewel colors to reflect the bright personalities of the girls. One costume designer said, quote, I don't care what the history books say. For me, let's exaggerate. Lady of Wild Times keeping watch. Hi, Noria. The elegance. <laughs> Number 7. The Hairstyles – Wrong The Buccaneers' costume designers may have bent the rules, but when it came to the hairstyles, they threw away the rule book. I was a mess. Should I should have seen the state I was in. Can we just please go inside and talk? Victorian women were expected to wear their hair up after they were out in society, and especially once they were married. They would rarely be seen in public without a hat. Hair was grown long, usually curled, and piled up on top of the head in elaborate styles. Short, loose hair, as favored by Nan St. George in the show, didn't become the rage until the 1920s. Darling, please! The guests will be arriving any minute, and I want to show you off. Why? In The Buccaneers, the American girls are styled as a contrast to the more reserved British characters. However, American women, as well as the British, were bound by these rules of fashion and propriety. Goodness, what a lady you are. Mm, all I've ever wanted to be. Number 6. Attitudes to Illegitimacy – Right While this adaptation of Edith Wharton's work has a fun and contemporary flavor, it's still very much set in the past. Mabel and Honoria must navigate their romantic relationship in a society where homosexuality is still taboo. Conchita, Ginny, and Mrs. St. George all suffer due to the unequal nature of Victorian marriage. Meanwhile, Nan is cursed with the stigma of illegitimacy. One of Daddy's dalliances. Mother wanted to avoid a scandal. 
Nobody knew, nobody knows. In the 19th century, children born out of wedlock were not considered respectable members of society. Their parentage was often kept secret and they couldn't inherit property under the law. And I have to tell him, Cheetah. And I have to tell Mother. And no, I no, no, you mustn't tell anyone. If anyone knows, if anyone finds, I mean, you say your past is a lie now, but your future, I mean, it won't exist. The revelation of Nan's illegitimacy would have been a big deal in this era. The reactions of the other characters feel consistent with the time period. Well, at least we're not the most ashamed here. His father will be turning in his grave. Number 5. Divorce and Separation Right. When Theo decides to stand by Nan, her mother finds the courage to ask her husband for a divorce. You marrying Theo lets me be myself again. Even the scandal of divorce won't shut out the mother of a duchess from society. But was this a realistic expectation for the time? Under the doctrine of coverture, married women were under the authority of their husbands. They couldn't own property, earn money in their own names, or bring lawsuits. This changed as individual states in the U.S. began to enact Married Women's Property Acts, beginning in 1839. I believe I'm leaving you. Oh, gee. Sweetheart, without me, you have nothing. Not true. Not anymore. It nonetheless remained challenging for a woman to get divorced, especially in conservative New York State, where adultery was the sole grounds. However, it was possible. The Buccaneers author Edith Wharton was herself divorced in 1913. No more talking. And no more pretending to laugh at your jokes. Or turning my back every time something young and pretty catches your eye. I have always deserved more. Number 4. Social Etiquette and Behaviors Wrong First things first, down your drinks and go down the lawn and spin as fast as ever you can! Go, go, go! There is a difference, of course, between what was legally possible within the confines of Victorian society and what was socially acceptable. Divorce would have been frowned upon, but so would many other things. For example, the modern-day manners of the Buccaneers' protagonist would have been considered pretty scandalous. Everybody look! Look and learn! See the party! The TV series is a contemporary take on a classic story, and the central group of girls are written to be relatable to a young, modern-day audience. They drink at parties, dispense with bonnets, and act like 21st century teenagers, rather than the Victorian idea of young ladies. The premise of the show pits the Americans against the prim and proper English characters, but realistically, the differences would have been a lot more subtle. They're never still. Not one of them. They toss about so. Number 3. Power Imbalance in Marriage Right. The pressure to act and present yourself a certain way would have come from society as a whole, but the Buccaneers demonstrates it most effectively through individual characters. Theo is the main event tonight. You can stand silently by his side. Which is the job, of course. Theo's mother is the voice of the aristocracy, determined to preserve the dignity of the Duke at all costs. But the real villain of the piece is Ginny's husband, James. Through him, the show demonstrates the potential dangers of marriage during this era. Okay, well, I'll go get mother. Go get no, 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 no. She'll go straight to Sweden and she wouldn't be able to help herself and then she'd tell Daddy. I just can't look, I don't have long any minute. He's gonna realize that I'm gone. As shown in the series, the imbalance of power between a husband and wife left women open to abuse. Once she's married, Ginny cannot call her life her own. She's at the mercy of her husband, whom she's expected to love, honor, and obey. Is that what you want? Honestly. I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Number 2. American Heiresses in England Right. Fast courtships conducted in the presence of chaperones didn't much help the state of Victorian marriages. Many married couples were practically strangers at the beginning of their life together. This was often the case for the so-called dollar princesses. There was talk, Mrs. Paramore, that for certain girls of refinement, New York has become too limited. Very limited, I quite agree. This late Victorian phenomenon involved eligible American heiresses of the Gilded Age. They traveled to England in search of a title and were courted by cash-poor aristocrats, looking to restore their fortunes. Richard has a knack for picking up things that are worth money. Edith Wharton's novel focuses on a group of these young women, as does Apple TV's new adaptation. 
Whatever liberties the show takes with the historical details, its central premise is based on a real and fascinating period in British history. Before we know it, there won't be a family left in England without American poison in its veins. Without them, how shall we afford poison? Or veins? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Accuracy to the Book – Wrong So, The Buccaneers has its moments of historical accuracy, but how true is it to its source material? Well, not very. Show creator Catherine Jakeways described the book as, quote, a starting point. She's expanded the characters and changed up the plot. Four weeks since we left London, and you've not once been yourself. Well, maybe I'm not who you think I am. In the novel, Nan isn't illegitimate, Mabel and Honoria's relationship isn't romantic, and Miss Tess Valley isn't so sinister. It's clear from the start that Guy's interest in Nan is genuine, not motivated by money. Theo's name is Ushant, and he isn't as sympathetic. I've told the whole world that I love you unconditionally. But I will not fight for someone who deep down doesn't want me in the same way. The book was unfinished at the time of Edith Wharton's death. Author Marion Manwaring created a finished version in 1993. The show ends very differently, but there's definitely room for a season two. Perhaps we'll get that happy ending after all. Who comes first? Always. 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 We come first. Have you been enjoying The Buccaneers and have you read the book? Let us know in the comments. This country has put ideas into her head. You know, I've always had ideas in my head. It's only now I realize people might want to hear them. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.